Hi, welcome to this Friends of Tracking episode. Today, I'm gonna to be introducing the concept of pitch control and walking you through some extensions and context uh, surrounding it. So just to introduce myself first, my name is William Spearman, and I'm the lead data scientist at Liverpool Football Club. Uh, before joining the club, I worked at a company called Huddle, and uh, while I was there, um, my coworkers and I developed a lot of these ideas around um, quantifying the control of space in football that I'll be showing you today. So let's go ahead and get started with a definition. Pitch control at a particular location is simply the probability that a player could control the ball, assuming it were at that location. So rather than dwell on this definition, let's go ahead and actually look at an example, because I think that's easier that, to illustrate it. So this is the model that my coworkers and I developed back in 2015 and 2016. The, um, what we're seeing here is a single frame of player tracking data from a football game. The red dots are the uh, home players, the blue dots are the away players, and the white dot is the ball. Now the, the little velocity vectors um, are showing you the direction that that player is traveling in, and that's computed from the tracking data. Uh, may not be 100% accurate, um, and I believe Lori will actually be discussing how to get these sorts of physical uh, higher order derivatives directly from the tracking data. Um, you can also see the regions of control. So around the keeper, for example, the home team has complete control. Um, and similarly for the away team around the keeper, um, they have complete control. In the midfield, there's a lot, it's a very changing uh, situation, which we'll see here in a second when I run the animation. Um, and as you can see, generally speaking, the players have a bit more control in front of them in the direction that they're running uh, towards. And we'll kind of discuss the nuances of this later. So here, let's go ahead and watch the video. As you can see, the ball pings around a little bit. Uh, the control is changing. Basically, the different the distance between the center back and the striker is kind of closing down the space controlled by that spot striker and opening space up, et cetera, et cetera. So what we can do now is go ahead and kind of start from a first principles perspective to look at um, how this sort of model can be developed. So what we're going to do here is we're going to kind of walk through the steps that allow you to kind of develop a, a concept of pitch control. And the first um, thing you probably ask yourself when hearing the, the term pitch control, I know what a pitch is, obviously, but what is control? How do we define that in some sort of mathematical, quantifiable way? Um, so the simplest way to do that is obviously to just say that the player who's closest to the ball is in control of the ball. Now, this is obviously not always the case for, for many reasons, but if we use a very simple approach, it can lead to some fast results. So in this little example here, we see three players, two blue players and one red player and a ball. Now, using this very simple notion of control, where we say that the player closest to the ball is in control of the ball, we would say that this blue player then is in control. So extending this concept, not just to the ball where it currently is, but to the whole pitch, we can actually um, quantify the regions that are controlled by the blue players using this definition of control and the red player. So this sort of view of pitch control, we call a Voronoi tessellation. And it's a mathematical concept uh, that's been used for a long time to basically split space into regions. Um, that are closest to one point or another. And so this is a very, very well understood mathematical concept that's been used in sports and has been extended in a lot of ways. Now, one of the things you may notice looking at the velocity vectors here is that the red player is actually moving in the direction of the ball. So even though the blue player is closer to the ball, the red player is moving in that direction. So one of the first things you might ask yourself is, well, if the red player is actually moving that direction, then even though he's not closer, he can probably get there faster. And that's a very good point, because what you're thinking about is the fact that it's not distance that matters so much to controlling a space, it's the time. So what we can do is we can kind of use some very simple physical approximations around a maximum speed and a maximum acceleration uh, for these players to compute how long it would take each of these players with some starting speed and uh, velocity vector to reach different locations on the pitch. And so here's what we get when we do that. And now the ball is actually in the red region of control. So by doing a Voronoi based on time rather than on distance, that changes the dynamics of this situation um, to be much more realistic around who we would actually say from a footballing perspective 
is in control of the ball here. And as before, we can kind of um, quantify different regions of red control and blue control based on this time to intercept or time to a location that it would take a player to run to that point on the pitch. Now, another thing that's obviously very important in sports in general is that very little is certain. Um, and when doing data science, when doing modeling, when doing physics, we always need to deal with uncertainty. And so you've seen numerous football games where a player will have an easy chance um, and will somehow, you know, sky it over the crossbar or, or, or whatnot. So nothing is ever certain in football and nothing should be certain in our models of pitch control either. So rather than take the time to intercept and say whoever has the lowest time to a given location is in control of it, let's take those times to intercept and put them through some sort of model where we can quantify the probability that one player or another is in control of a given point on the pitch. So doing that, we get a, a model kind of similar to this, and we can use different parameterizations. Um, and the nice thing about this is now we can fit this model to data. So by looking at situations where the ball is at a location on the pitch um, and maybe the ball is fairly stationary and then we can um, compute the control different players have on it and we can actually see which player um, ends up making the next controlled touch using event data. Um, and so that allows us to actually fit this sort of probabilistic model of control. So now let's go ahead and put this all together uh, to kind of show you an example of how pitch control can be used. Now, what I'm going to show you here is a video um, of a tool that we developed while I was at Huddle that allows you to interact with the pitch control while the video is playing um, to kind of explore how space is created or closed down or uh, opened up. So in this situation, we have the blue team attacking right to left. And what you're going to see here is how the two red center backs, uh, players number seven and number two, get pulled apart, which opens up space for the blue striker, player 28. Uh, the, the, the pass then comes in to player 28, who's able to get on the end of it and, and score from it. So let's go ahead and watch this video here. 27 passes to 16, 16 passes to 24. Now here we can see this massive amount of space that's opened up between the two red center backs. Uh, if, if player two was a little bit closer to 28, I would close it down. And if player seven had stayed a bit more narrow, that would have also closed it down. But the run there of the wide player, 22, has opened up that space in the middle for then the pass to come in, player 28 to receive it, and to score. So this isn't necessarily the most... Um, innovative use of tracking data or the most innovative use of pitch control. Um, watching the video, you would probably get more or less the exact same story as looking at the pitch control model. But the fact that we're able to see something that's very football specific in a visualization of the data implies that there's various models we could build on top of this pitch control model that would allow us to perhaps um, dynamically identify these situations or analyze them in one way or another. So before moving on, let's go ahead and discuss um, some questions and context around pitch control. So first off, uh, it's important to note that in football analytics and in football statistics, anytime we try to measure something, it gets used in ways that it probably shouldn't to try to say something about performance. So we've seen this sometimes with the punditry around the total distance run, where um, you know, people might measure the total amount of distance run by a team and try to infer something about the performance of the team from that. Similarly, with pitch control, um, you could easily get trapped into the mode of thinking that the team with the more pitch control um, is going to uh, have had a, a better performance. And to some extent, that there will be a correlation there due to the fact that there is some correlation between possession and um and, and domination in the, in the game. But obviously counterattacking strategies um, can, can invert that. And so just because you have more possession and therefore you have more pitch control over the course of a match doesn't necessarily mean uh, your performance was, was better. Um, and if we break this down into the per player level, that becomes extremely clear. So 
For example, um, in this situation, the blue team is attacking right to left, and the keeper here is in a huge amount of space, which he's controlling. However, that space is not particularly relevant because the team isn't really doing anything with it. Now, you could say that, um, you know, if the player who's on the ball comes under pressure, he may wish to pass back. And so by not having to select a precise pass, um, and that space, you know, that the keeper or the center backs is in, are in, um, may be quite valuable to make that, that sort of um, retaining possession sort of passing easier. But overall, the, the space that the keeper and the center backs on the attacking team are in isn't uh, a particularly good indicator of the quality of the possession or the quality of the attack. And therefore, it shouldn't be used to measure anything about um, the team's performance, really. So one way to kind of um, quantify this would be to say, well, the pitch control we're interested in is the pitch control that's going to be closer to the ball, because that's more relevant space to control. So what we can actually do is we can build a model um, that we can call relevant pitch control that highlights the control um, near the vicinity that the play is occurring, um, and that allows us to kind of evaluate pitch control that's important. And so we'll get into how we can do that later. Now, a second question is the fact that this model doesn't seem to incorporate anything about the motion of the ball. So we can see, obviously, that it's not highlighting relevant regions that are near the ball. But furthermore, it is not taking into account the fact that for the ball to reach uh, more distant regions, we would have to, it would take some time. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to be computing the pitch control at some point far away from the ball when it would take three or four seconds for the ball to reach that point and the state there could have evolved substantially. So to be able to deal with that, we have to introduce kind of a dynamic control model uh, for ball control. And we'll discuss this later. Um, but this new model we can then call dynamic pitch control and it will have some interesting features. So in regions that are far from the ball, here you can see if the ball is at this point um, and you know, there's the, the regions far from it, um, those are going to be much less certain about who's, who would be controlling those because by the time, you know, the, the ball carrier or the, the player on the ball is able to pass to that point, um, defenders will have had a chance to converge and potentially contest that pass. So the control far from the ball is going to be much less uh, certain. Now, the last thing that I think is really important to point out is the fact that not all parts of the pitch are equally valuable. And we kind of hit on this earlier with the fact that the keeper is a control of a huge amount of space. Um, but obviously, an attacking team wants to get closer to uh, their target goal. And so those the control in that space is going to be much more relevant. So for example, if I'm um, a striker and I'm making a run in behind the defense, I'm going to actually be um, exerting control on space behind the defensive line while I'm still on sides. And that space is very valuable, even if it's fairly small, because that is creating a chance for our team to score. Um, and so what we have to do is we have to be able to incorporate information about the, the fact that the pitch is not, um, all points of the pitch are not equally val uh, valuable. So by incorporating that, we can introduce a concept that I like to call scoring opportunity. Um, which will allow us to compute kind of the danger of a given situation. So just to kind of recap here, um, there's, you know, three, I think, very important questions that people um, ask a lot of times when they see a pitch control model. Um, and we can build additional models to kind of add the context that's necessary in order to use pitch control in a meaningful way rather than just as kind of a, a visualization tool, which is really all it is um, by itself. So now let's go ahead and introduce this dynamic control model. So for this model, what I wanted to do is encapsulate in as simple of a way as possible uh, the fundamental principle that the more time you have on the ball, the more able you are to make a controlled pass or controlled touch of some sort. 
So we can model this using just a simple exponential. So the probability of control is just a rate parameter times the time interval that the player is in the vicinity of the ball. And obviously integrating this, we get an exponential um, CDF, and we can see an example of that here. So on the x-axis is the time that the player is on the ball, and on the y-axis is the probability that that player is able to make a controlled touch given that amount of time that they are uh, on the ball. And so this is fit to data, and one thing we can see here is that 90% of the time it takes the player less than a second to be able to make um, a controlled touch on the ball. And obviously there's going to be outliers in either either direction. You know, um, players are generally able to make kind of split-second uh, reflex touches from time to time, and sometimes you can kind of whiff it, so it might take um, longer to, to make that controlled touch. So let's go ahead and kind of take this um, integrated cumulative distribution function of the time it takes a player to control it and kind of step it back and just evaluate a, um, a discreetly integrated uh, model here. So what we'll do is we will look at a situation where the ball is moving in one direction along the ground um, with a little bit of drag, so it's slowing down slightly at every time step. And we're going to split it into time steps that are discreetly spaced. So let's say these time steps are maybe, I don't know, a tenth of a second long. So as the ball kind of reaches um, this point where the player A, the player, the red player, is able to uh, intercept it, or um, we can then say that in this first point one of a second when it's in his kind of interception radius, um, that this player has, let's say, 10% chance um, to make a control touch on the ball in this 0.1 seconds. Now, when it moves kind of to the next time step, we have to assume, obviously, that the player didn't make a control touch in that first time step or it wouldn't have reached this point. So there's a 90% chance that it even gets here. And then we multiply that by a 10% chance that they make a controlled touch in this time step. So that's 9%. And then we do it for the third time step, so that's 81 times 10%, 8.1%. And that, those three kind of time steps, so what we're saying there is that there's 0.3 seconds where player A could potentially um, make a controlled touch on the ball. So it could get to the interception trajectory of the ball and make a controlled touch. And within those 0.3 seconds, we give player A a 27.1% chance of uh, controlling the pass or making some sort of controlled touch. Now, assuming player A doesn't, then player B uh, gets his shot. And in the first kind of time interval where player B is able to um, intercept the trajectory of the pass, we have the remaining probability, which in this case is 72.9% uh, times 10%, so 7.3%. For the next 0.1 seconds, we get 6.6. .6, and then for the remaining, you know, I'm not going to go through the math here, but this integrates to a total of 34.2% chance of player B being able to control this pass. So this model obviously has some nice features. It's um, it includes information about the conditional nature of the probabilities. So players who are further along the trajectory of a pass um, can only receive that pass if a player before them hasn't. Um, and it encapsulates some information that is common sense, namely that the longer uh, you have on the ball, the, the more likely you are to be able to control it. Um, and then thirdly, this approach allows us to kind of deal with situations where the control region overlaps because um, those two players both have a chance to make a controlled touch. So by discretizing, sorry, by discretizing um, this integral into smaller and smaller time steps, i.e. doing this integration rather than a summation, um, we can actually get the actual probability of each of those two players being able to make a, a controlled touch on the ball, even when those control regions overlap. So the second question is, um, one that we kind of glossed over here in this first part, which is basically how long it takes a player to reach the interception point. And for a dynamically moving ball in this passing situation, um, we can use physics to basically take a point on this trajectory and compute how long it would take a player, assuming some maximum speed and acceleration, to reach that point. Um, but 
in in a pitch control setting, we can kind of do the same thing where we take a point on the pitch and we, we take the player's current speed and, and use some maximum speed and maximum acceleration to calculate how long it would take them to reach that point on the pitch. Now, we have to turn that time it would take a player to reach that point on the pitch into a probability of being able to get to that point. And this is going to encapsulate some uncertainty in a few different areas. One is the tracking data is never perfect, so we don't know for sure that the player will be able to get there in that time. Two, um, they may be moving there with, um, you know, a higher maximum velocity or acceleration than we've seen in the data, or maybe a lower one than we've seen in the data. So they're, they're kind of... Um, their effort may vary, their awareness may vary, a lot of things may vary. So we take this time to intercept that we compute and we effectively put it through a sigmoid distribution um, whose parameters we fit to be able to get the probability that the player is able to get to that intercept um, in some time frame. So what this allows us to do is it allows us to evaluate dynamic situations and obviously one dynamic situation in football is passing. So here's um, an actual example where the ball is moving, you know, from left to right. We've kind of rotated into the reference frame of the ball so that the X motion um, is the direction of motion of the ball. It's along the ground and it is slowing down. So it slows down to a stop or it would do if given enough time. And player zero, you know, he's close to the trajectory of this ball, but he would have to get there very fast. And so his total kind of control region is relatively small temporally. Um, the dashed lines here each represent a 0.1 second uh, time step, I believe. Um, I can't remember if it's 0.1 seconds or if it's actually even less than that. But anyway, it represents some fixed time step. And there's only a, a few of those. So if it is 0.1 seconds, then that's going to be about... 0.4 seconds where player zero has a chance at receiving that pass. Now player one and player two have much, much larger time and spatial windows um, where they could receive that pass. But again, it's all conditional. So in this case, player one has a 56% chance of receiving it. Player two has a 26.2% chance of receiving it. And the nice thing about this is we can actually build a probability dens uh, density function or a cumulative distribution function of the probability of control at different points in time and at different points in space uh, for each of the three players and for those three players as a whole. So this allows us to get a kind of a full holistic view of where this pass is likely to be received, who it's likely to be received by, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we can convert this back into a pitch control model um, by simply computing the dynamic control um, at different locations on the pitch, um, but only starting that integration when the ball should arrive there. So here, to do that, we need a ball time of flight model. And so you can use all sorts of things for that, but a simple one is just distance divided by some ball speed that you think is sensible. Um, in the Beyond Expected Goals paper, I use a, a more complicated model for this ball time of flight, but more or less anything will work to a first approximation. So here we have this ball time of flight model. And as you can see, you know, in regions far from the ball, it takes about 4.5 seconds for the ball to reach there. If the region's close, it's close to zero seconds. And so by starting this dynamic control integration at the time it would take the ball to reach there, that will allow various players to converge. And so you can see here, as we showed before, in regions far from the ball, uh, where there was a lot of certainty around who would control it, there's now a lot less certainty. So like here, for example, um, in the kind of traditional pitch control, we know that this blue player is in control here, but because it would take a while for the ball to reach that point, he has a lot less control there. So now we're going to move on to our relevant pitch control model. And the reason we do this one second, even though we had kind of discussed it first earlier, is because we're going to use the dynamic pitch control field uh, that we just talked about as an input into our relevant pitch control field. So the first thing we have to do is to define what we mean by relevant in a football context. And a relevant region of the pitch is going to be a region where um, the ball is likely to be in play within some time frame. So for long time frames, that could be pretty much any region of the pitch. But for shorter time frames what, that we're kind of concerned with, that's going to be regions that are relatively close to where the ball currently is. Although there's obviously some vanishingly small probability of it going very, very far away. 
Um, so what we do is we define relevance as the probability that the next touch is at a given location on the pitch. So the transition probability effectively. And we build a simple transition probability model using as inputs the probability of control, i.e. the pitch control of the, the team that's currently in possession and the distance from the player who's currently in possession. So here you can see kind of this simple model that we've built that um, highlights the relevant regions of the pitch for this simple example. And this gives us this relevant pitch control uh, field here, um, which highlights the two players that um, the on-ball player is likely to pass to. So in this case, they're actually the, 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 the space they're controlling is probably the most relevant. Um, as you can see, the player on the ball is under some pressure, so he's likely to try to pass it um, to one of these two players. He could attempt the through ball, but those players um, don't have a lot of space due to this dynamic control that we've computed, and um, they're a bit further away. So it's a possibility, but it's less likely. So in this case, the, the most relevant regions are the, the regions controlled by these two players on his same team. Now, the last model we kind of want to look at for adding context to pitch control is scoring opportunity. So the model we use here is just a very, very, very simple scoring model where we look at the probability of scoring um, given a controlled touch at a particular point on the pitch. And it can be the probability of scoring within a possession. It can be the probability of scoring with that touch. Um, any model can work. You just need to define which model you're using and that's gonna have an impact on what sort of scoring opportunity you're quantifying. Now, here we can kind of see this model. It's, you know, one when you're at the goal mouth and it becomes vanishingly small, far from goal. So by multiplying the relevant pit control, which is basically telling us where the ball is likely to go, times the probability of controlling it there, along with this scoring probability map, we can get what we call this off-ball scoring opportunity. And this highlights the regions of the pitch where um, the next touch in a scoring chain is likely to come from. And so this is allowing us to basically weight the pitch control by how dangerous it is. And what's interesting about this is that the players who didn't seem to have very relevant pitch control actually have quite a bit of scoring opportunity. So for example, this striker who is um, you know, just staying on sides here, because he's in a relatively dangerous situation for this context, he has a relatively high scoring opportunity, um, or his contribution to the scoring opportunity is relatively high. So with this scoring opportunity model, we have to first contextualize it in the context of actual scoring. Now, here's an example of an off-ball scoring opportunity. Here we have a player who is you know, at the edge of the penalty area, and he has a teammate who is completely unmarked near the penalty spot. Now, for this to result in a goal, um, the player who's on the ball has to convert this scoring opportunity by passing to the, the player who's in space. Now the player in space um, will be in possession of the ball, but he still has to finish the chance um, by deciding to shoot and then um, scoring with that shot, resulting in goals, which is obviously what wins games. So as with other sorts of models that can be used to evaluate the danger of a situation, such as expected assists, um, expected goals, we can build um, various scoring opportunity maps. And we can look at scoring opportunity versus time to highlight dangerous moments that may have occurred you know, at a given point during the match. Uh, or to look and see how the shots uh, kind of correlated. So here on this scoring opportunity map, you can see the Xs are shots in this particular game and the uh, circles are shots that resulted in a goal. Now what's a bit interesting in this particular situation, this particular example, is that both teams actually scored one goal, but one team took massively more shots. So you can see the blue team um, took only five shots, whereas the red team uh, took far, far more. But they both generated one goal and they both generated very similar scoring opportunities. Another thing you can look at is um, a player trend analysis. So here are the scoring opportunity maps for a given right back for three different games. And as you can see, his scoring opportunities generally come from uh, wide right positions outside the penalty area. 
uh, where he's clearly operating in space um, with the possibility of, of, of scoring. Now, if you were to look at this as an opposition analyst, you would notice that he hasn't actually scored. So he's taken you know four shots in three games. Um, but he's getting in enough space to kind of merit um, about 0 0.3, 0 0.2 goals per game. And sure enough, in the third, or sorry, in the fourth game, he actually shoots twice and scores twice from that same area that we had highlighted from his previous three games. So this would be a way to identify trends that could be um, exploited. So just to recap here, we've introduced pitch control, uh, which is itself a contextualization of Voronoi tessellation using the physical characteristics, i.e. the velocity and acceleration of players to develop a time to intercept and to render that as a probability of control. Additionally, we've added some contextual features such as a transition probability model, which allows us to build a relevant pitch control model. Uh, we've added the time of flight of the ball to allow us to see kind of a dynamic pitch control model. Um, and that same model can be used to evaluate passing situations. Um, and then lastly, we've uh, incorporated a scoring value model um, alongside our transition and pitch control models to be able to build a scoring opportunity uh, model that highlights the regions of the pitch that are controlled, that are valuable, and that the ball is likely to transition to. So hopefully this kind of shows you a framework that allows you to use tracking data uh, to quantify space and control and to relate that to the relevance of that space. So lastly, I just wanted to share with you some of the resources and papers available kind of in this uh, tracking spatial analysis space. Um, most of these papers are working off of a pitch control sort of framework uh, to evaluate uh, football and they extend the notion of pitch control in a lot of very innovative ways. So I would highly recommend going and reading um, a lot of these papers. You've got some excellent work from Javier Fernandez, David Sumter, um, Fran Peralta, and, and many others. So go ahead and check this out. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this lecture, and I will try to leave links to a lot of this work here in the description. And thank you. Have a good day.